Hey there, welcome to Fringe FM Tech Talks. I'm your host, Matt Ward. I'm a serial entrepreneur, startup advisor, futurist, and guy that's focused on making the world a bigger, better place. Today, we're talking about virtual reality. But first, if you haven't checked out Fringe FM, go to fringe.fm. Imagine TED, but long form. We get the world's smartest folks when it comes to AI, genetics, uh, stem cell therapy, biotech, space, quantum computing, you name it. And we have long form awesome conversations with these guys on not just their focuses, not just their fields, but everything surrounding it. We're living in an exponential age where everything is converging. And the only way where you can know the best, figure it out, and get there first, and probably make the world a better, smarter, safer place is to understand how it all goes together. That's what we do, fringe.fm. If that sounds cool and interesting, hit the subscribe button. Today we're talking about virtual reality, and today we're gonna be diving, diving deep, 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 deep into multiple worlds. But before we do that, what I'm excited about today, I like to start every one of these live streams out, and by the way, this is a recording, this is not a live stream because got a new mic and had to redo it because it sounded terrible. But what I'm ex really excited about today is the state of AR and VR, especially, I don't know if you've seen the Magic Leap demos. I have, not personally, but I've seen some of the articles that have been written about them. They're absolutely stunning. There's these really goofy looking cyberpunk type glasses, and we a lot of us know about AR, we know about VR, but just the advancement and what's happening right now. So Magic Leap is a, a hidden company out of Florida that's raised $2 billion to try to transform the world of AR. And you know what? The technology that they have, it looks pretty goddamn cool. If you haven't checked it out, look up Magic Leap demo or Magic Leap article and you can see a little bit more about what it looks like. You see people wearing the glasses and the experiences. You see a whale floating through a, a school uh, auditorium and while it might not live up quite to what they, they hyped two years or so ago when they first got started, if you see some of the other demos that they've done, it's incredibly, incredibly lifelike. You see a little elf walking around your room or following you about. It's kind of like a video game where suddenly you have things in real life. But not only are they there, they're not running through things. They're able to understand, here's where my desk is, here's where this is, here's where the couch is, etc. And, and not just walk through it, but sit on it. And that makes it really, really real. I would, I would recommend checking that out because it's really related to what we're talking about today, virtual reality. So for virtual reality, anyone who hasn't experienced it, A, you need to experience it. The first attempts for VR, those were done mainly in the 70s, 80s, and these were actually by entrepreneurs and Silicon Valley folks that were a bit into the into the mushrooms, the LSD. They were they were doing a lot of psychedelics and were like, I wonder if we could design a psychedelic experience that wasn't something where you had to take something, but you could just put on some glasses. And you know what? It didn't really work. And the reason it didn't really work is it's really, really highly compute intensive. I.e., when you're looking around, if there's a lag on what you're looking at, something doesn't feel right, you start to get dizzy, you start to get sick. So we need what's what's known as GPUs or graphical processing uh, graphics, I can't remember the, the term to be honest. It's what's being used right now with a lot of with a lot of Bitcoin and crypto mining with AI specifically to be able to run high-end tech. But it was designed initially for your Xbox, your PS3, for high-end gaming so that you could have really, really nicely rendered images and pixels. Well, that's suddenly what's revolutionizing VR, that and the cloud compute, where you've got Google's cloud, you've got Amazon's cloud, etc. You're able to run really, really high-end processes and have really nice output pretty quickly, which is allowing VR to become pretty interesting pretty quickly. I've tried it out. I've done both a headset experience and a full body headset, hands, gloves experience. The, the, the second one was, oh God, that was ridiculous. I'm afraid of heights and we're walking along on these little towers and suddenly freaking tower fall and you're just like sitting there pissing yourself. Thank God I didn't pee myself, but it's really, really lifelike. It's really, really immersive. It's really exciting. Those are kind of the two different ends or spectrums of VR is the fully immersive and then just the headset based. While the headset based ones are cool and you can have some really interesting experiences, it's not quite the same as fully immersive where you can see and feel your hands. Once we get a bit further along with VR, there is a lot of technology now that's able to sense where your hands are and give you a bit more of a feeling for something. But until we have it perfectly, it is a little bit off-putting. You, you do kind of feel like you're suddenly coming out of it. But it's something that if you haven't tried it out, it's it will change the world. It will be incredibly exciting, and I highly recommend doing it. So one last piece of overview before we jump into the implications of VR. So right now, there's really two competing technologies. These won't be competing in the future. Augmented reality and virtual reality. Augmented reality is I look around my room and I can see a couch projected over there. I can see on the wall a to-do list of what I need to do today. That's augmented reality. Adding something to the existing reality. It's painting something onto reality. 
Virtual reality, I'm looking around and I'm not seeing you or me. I'm seeing Neptune and suddenly there's Martians over here and I'm shaking hands and they pull out Papa John's pizza and everything is nuts. Virtual reality is completely designed experiences. Augmented reality is adding to what you're currently living in. And then there's mixed reality, which is kind of mixing between the two. Realistically, we'll move to headsets where you're able to see both projections and real world so that you can have a bit more of both. The last competing technology here is something straight out of Star Trek or Star Wars, holograms. Now I've talked to some really interesting folks on Fringe.fm. If you haven't checked it out, an episode with Roel Vertigal, he's one of the leading researchers when it comes to interface design, and he was talking a bit about the state of art when it comes to holograms. I, I highly, highly recommend checking that out. That's fringe.fm. You can also search here on YouTube. I recommend subscribing and looking into that. But holograms are coming way faster than we think. I've had a bunch of startups pitch me on funding for companies that are doing hologram-based customer service, et cetera, and hotels. And it's, it's a field that seems so freaking sci-fi, and yet if you see some of these holograms, it's pretty freaking terrifying that this is real life. So that's kind of where we're headed. Now we jump into the implications. The implications of VR. I think there's a lot. I think people have talked about some of them, but this is one of the things that I think about. You, you've ridden on the subway, you've ridden in the bus, everyone's in their phone. That's all they're doing. You see games, you see Facebook, you see all of this junk. People are continuously zoned in on their technology. And what happens when that technology isn't something boring like Candy Crush or Angry Birds, but it's a new world? Yeah, we needed to pause there for a sec, because ba dum bum -tsh, that's pretty goddamn dramatic. But in virtual reality, we can create as many worlds as we want to. Have you seen Ready Player One? If you haven't, or if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. It's an incredible book. It's the most realistic and dystopian virtual reality future that I've personally seen. And... It, it features what's called an oasis, and the oasis is kind of like uh, it's kind of like the internet, but instead of being the internet, it's worlds, and people plug into this. They have headsets, they have hands, etc. But the world has gone to shit because people are all living in these virtual realities, which are like incredible. You can be Kanye West, you can be flying across here, you can be sexy, you can be white, you can be black, you can be a dinosaur. It doesn't matter. Well. The problem is, <laughs> reality doesn't quite live up to that, so people start to forget about reality and live in this world, and this can be something that can be really, really challenging. If you wanna, if you wanna check this out, go to fringe.fm slash audible. You can get a free download of Ready Player One. Listen to that, and it will transform the way that you think about the future, especially virtual reality. And this, I think sci-fi is the best way to see the future. You're not gonna get it from people that are just talking about business. The, the people that are thinking outside the box are the sci-fi authors. We've had a couple on Fringe.fm, if you haven't checked those out, highly recommend it. But yeah, sci-fi is the way to go if you want to think futuristic. So VR, what are some other potential implications? Well, we have enough of a problem with everyone sitting at their desk working all day. We're not moving, we're getting fat, our butts are getting big, and we get stuck in the seats. How do you handle that in a world where suddenly everything is virtual? And while if people are standing and moving around a little bit, yes, that is definitely, I mean, better than sitting on your computer, but at the same time, there's no guarantee that's going to be happening. So... We may have VR exercise. Maybe that's the next big industry. You can be with like Jillian Michaels and be like dancing it out in the 80s or 70s or whatever and start burning off some calories. I mean, I, I personally would not uh, discount sex exercise. You want, to, you want to have fun? You want to burn some calories? Well, everything looks real. You might as well. Um, what about self-actualization, though? So as people are stuck in these VR worlds, are they feeling like they're developing? Are they feeling like they're learning, growing, and becoming a better person? Or are they feeling like a couch potato? A couch potato generally doesn't have a great self-esteem, isn't really contributing that much to society, and probably doesn't rate themselves that happy. And if they do, their scale is probably a bit skewed. What if that happens to all of us? Is this the reason why we haven't seen aliens from other species? Is they, they all kind of get to this level and then fall off. I don't know. So what happens? Is VR going to be an escape for people whose jobs have been displaced? I've seen this talked about before in terms of a dystopian type future. Well, if you could give someone food stamps and they could be eating at XYZ junk, or they could be living in virtual reality with like an IV jerk coming into their neck, but they're Kanye West and they have a hot girlfriend and they're driving an awesome car, which one do you want to choose? Well, it, it, it sounds pretty controversial, but most people are probably going to choose the second one, in which case we're kind of making a matrix of people where we just plug them in and just ignore them. So is, is that the future? It sounds wrong, but for them it might also sound right. What do we do? I don't know, but those are the things we need to talk about. What about relationships in VR? So more and more, I mean, the, the younger generation loves Tinder. They love things of this, and to be honest, the, the concept of relationship is changing quite a bit in today's 
society. But what happens when suddenly those relationships are having happening, not just across world, but across worlds, or you're never meeting the individual, or maybe, oh, he looks like Brad Pitt here, but ooh, that's actually a seven year old, 17 year old girl. That's definitely not Brad Pitt. How do relationships happen? How do we think about it? How do we think about race, color, religion, all of these things in a different world? It creates a lot of complexity. How do you think about, I mean, VR sex toys and dolls are probably going to be pretty popular. There's, there's certain things that people like, and you know, they definitely like when they can have more of them. I know I interviewed John Macascio on a, a very prominent futurist on Fringe FM. If you haven't checked it out, Fringe.fm, check that one out. That was a really, really good one. But he was basically saying the future will be filled with uh, sex, drugs, and robots. And this covers all three of those. Because if you want to have fun, dance in the sun, and act like a, act like a rock star, there's no better way to do it than with a, a VR robot, right? Um, so when it comes to virtual reality, what are some of the use cases? So the one thing that I think could be interesting is increasing empathy. Um, have you ever been a Have you ever been a poor girl in India that every time you're walking by, you're, you're hearing snide comments or men looking at you or being touched, etc.? Well, what if what if suddenly you could put people into that experience? It's pretty hard to replicate in real life because it's dangerous. And most people aren't going to want to try it. But what if VR could help us with empathy? It could. It can help us with job training as well. This is especially prevalent in the military in places where it might be good to kill people, but it's not actually that great to kill people in practice if you're practicing with your friends. So there, there's a lot of job training applications. We'll talk about those a little bit more in the future. And then entertainment. You can see the world. Will I even still need to travel? Will I just go into VR? I don't know. But these are, these are some of the things that people need to be thinking about. Will we kill the airline industry? Hopefully for meetings, at least, we can get rid of those because that's just polluting the hell out of the environment. No one likes meetings. If I can do my meeting from here and I look like I'm with you and we've got a hologram or we're in VR, I know TED Talks and some cer certain things are starting to do this more. I know some VCs that are taking pitch meetings in VR. There's a lot of interesting applications and implications. But there's one problem. Foodies. A lot of people like food. They like to eat. I am personally not much of a foodie, but I know a lot of people are, and they like to go to fancy restaurants and hold their hand up when they're drinking their tea and all of this. What about VR food testing, tasting? How do we eat food in VR? That's a major problem that people haven't thought about, people haven't talked about, and I've never seen discussed in any type of sci-fi books. But what happens? Do we suddenly like go to Paris and instead of eating like incredible croissants and coffee and eggs and yada 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 we, we we have bread or we have iv injecting food into us or maybe we just hit up like pleasure hormones or something i don't know but it uh that's something where if you can have a nice vr culinary experience maybe it'll be the only one now we jump into the pros of vr so vr it has the ability to create a ton of freaking jobs and i know that m people might think that's not true but you know what it is both in vr and in real life so in real life we're going to need headsets, we're going to need handsets, we're going to need footsets, we're going to need sex toys and robots and all of these things that go with having a VR experience where you can feel, act, and live it out. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of money to be made there. There's also the software and experiences, which are going to be incredibly important. If we don't have great experiences, VR will never take off. So those experiences, the ability to connect us better and remove some of these racial barriers and stereotypes, the ability to let you walk again when your legs are broken, the ability to do incredible, amazing, godlike things on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a shit ton of money in that. That one's obvious. But what about in VR? Well, in VR, it's it's more complicated, but yet it's also not. Um, we live in a real world, right? Well, what if this was just one of many worlds and we could jump between them? I run a podcast. Maybe I do consulting. Maybe I run a bread store. Maybe I give sexy massages. Um, it doesn't really matter. I, I have a business. I have services. Well, the same will be true in VR. What kind of services will exist in VR that we've never thought of? Maybe you'll need someone to garden your virtual home. Maybe you'll want a designer to give you something special. Maybe you want to get a tattoo sprayed on there. But you know what? You need someone who can do it, who's got the, who's got the designs, etc. What about the home designs? What about licensing an IP for all of these products? What about creating the real world that's actually the real world, but just a replica of the real world? How in God's name do we think about all this? No one's even discussing this that I know of. I've seen some interesting projects like Decentraland, which are trying to create virtual worlds where you can buy, sell things, have blockchain type commerce, etc. And blockchain will probably be pretty interesting when it comes to VR because how else are you going to pay for something? I'm not going to give you cash. There's going to be some type of economy that comes into play. So in Second Life, people there's a billion dollars spent every year in Second Life. Second Life is the first kind of virtual world that people created. And that's a billion US dollars on 
virtual goods in Second Life. Well, I imagine if you're really living this, there's going to be a shit ton more than a billion dollars spent. That'll be really interesting, creating not just an entirely new segment of the economy, but an entirely new world economy. Yes, that needed a pause because it's pretty, it's pretty impactful in my, in my opinion. I think VR will be driven at least initially, as you've kind of alluded, as I've kind of alluded to from the, this episode so far, from porn and prostitution, the the things that drive, uh, the things that drive um, the majority of fringe commerce initially. So adult pleasures. So between creating experiences, creating better headsets, creating toys, creating the hands, creating the actual marketplace and logistics behind offering services through a virtual world, creating the currencies, creating all of this stuff. They need it first. They're kind of creepy. They're going to put the time, money, and effort into doing that. And then as what happens with Patreon, where, I mean, Patreon was initially like people that wanted to do dirty, dirty webcams and make some money from that. Well, eventually Patreon kicked them off because they have standards now. But that's how a lot of businesses initially got traction was by riding off of the things that are pretty primal. Let's talk about cons of VR. So we talked about a little bit. What happens if society dissolves without people even noticing? We talked about Ready Player One. Again, you can check out the audiobook, listen to that completely for free with a free trial, and you can cancel the trial and still keep the book. Uh, Fringe.fm slash audible. Just search for Ready Player One. It's an incredibly good book. I highly, highly recommend it. One of my favorites. But um, what about in terms of Westworld? Um, I don't know if you've watched it, but Westworld is essentially a world where humans have created an alternative world where there's robots, and you go there, and it's like a theme park, and you do whatever you want. You can shoot Dorothy in the head, you can do dirty things, you can rob banks, you can be as bad and evil as you want. The idea isn't to do that, but that's just what people do. That's the human nature that seems to come out in this evil theme park. What if we're living in a virtual world? Will we start to move some towards something like that? I can kill that guy over there, and I didn't actually kill him, so it's okay. But then how does that action and... My, my way of thinking about the world merge with how I actually live when I come out of VR. Do I become an evil person? And we've talked about this a little bit. I mean, you've seen way too much in terms of school shootings and people blaming it on video games. And that's obviously a joke to not have to talk about the guns issue. But what about legitimately when it is virtual reality and you are fucking living this and stabbing someone in the heart? You've got to be kind of dirty evil person to do that, right? Well, what happens to society when suddenly we have more and more people with access to this and probably doing this in some capacity? What happens? What about access? Right now, internet, it, it's not exactly a right, but damn it, if you've ever lived in an apartment without internet, suddenly you're like, how oh, in God's name did people do this before? It's like electricity. You just have to have it. And that's kind of what happens with luxury. Well, what about with VR? What if we don't have equal access and certain people have access to VR, other people don't? Is that a right? Is that a privilege? When does it become a right? When does it become a privilege? In Ready Player One, there's a business that essentially doesn't care about being a business that gives it away to the world. And that's incredible. But will we have that in the real world? Or will people be more realistic and less idealistic? I don't know. That's kind of scary. And then there is the all-important question. Inception. How the fuck do you know if you're in virtual reality? If you have really good VR, you're living in this experience. How do you know if you're Neo in the Matrix or you're Neo outside of the Matrix? I don't think Keanu knew, and I don't think a lot of people would know if you have the red pill or the blue pill. Well, that's really, really scary going forward. It's hard to tell what's real and what's not. And I think we need to have some type of rules, laws, etc., governing this so that people are able to know this is virtual reality. Because if you know that, you know it's not something you've been plugged into, then you might react a little bit differently. If you think you're living in the real world and you kill someone, you might be doing something wrong. If you think you're living in a world of knights where everyone goes around swinging swords and having fun, maybe that's totally cool. But what if you weren't? That's a question mark. And now we jump into everybody's favorite part, and especially my favorite part, the predictions. So we talked about the porn and prostitution driving VR. I think that part's been kicked to death, so to speak. Virtual commerce is going to start to make up a larger and larger portion of our overall economy. And think about it in terms of space. Think about it in terms of goods. Think about it in terms of everything. If I can have one house, or I can have 50 mansions in VR, well, 50 times this is, hmm, that's a bigger number. Well, the same thing's going to happen in terms of worlds, skills, skins, clothes, uh, robotic girlfriends, etc. 
it's larger and larger and larger expanding world. That means there's going to make up a larger portion of the overall economy, potentially eclipsing the overall economy, possibly potentially eclipsing the real world economy dollars like it does in, in uh, Ready Player One. I don't know, but I think they'll probably be in-app currencies, hopefully ones that are a bit ubiquitous between different worlds, and that'll correlate somehow to money just like it does in Second Life. So maybe you have a thousand Second Life dollars and that's a thousand US dollars or et cetera, et cetera. They'll probably be fluctuating exchange rates. They'll probably be um, like NASDAQ, there'll probably be um, currency trading booths, etc., all related to all of these things. That'll be really interesting to see how that affects the real world. Maybe that's what helps us in terms of jobs. We might lose some jobs due to automation and manufacturing, where we don't need you. Sorry, we don't need you anymore to drive a truck. But you know what? Now you can have a job in VR and go build houses. I don't know. Could be interesting. We talked a little bit about it before, but in terms of an early adoption to VR. VR right now is a bit expensive. It only goes to people that are in really extreme situations, and that would be military and sports. People that have the money and are willing to blow some money on performance. So in the military, you don't want to get blown up by a bomb. You want to be able to shoot someone in the head. You don't want it to be your, your friend. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for VR. Same thing with sports. You've got the quarterback. It probably doesn't help for him to get tackled a hundred times, but if he can just read the play and go through the real experiences of dropping back and passing, that's incredibly productive for him. And we can see from muscle memory that VR has a lot of the same implications. I mean, I talked about it before. When the tower fell and I thought I was going to fall off, you know what? I was scared for my freaking life. And I'm in a virtual reality experience standing on the floor. It, it, it's crazy how the mind can trick you into something once the, once the resolution is good enough. Also the matrix problem we talked about before. VR will start to take off once hardware is below $100 to $200 per unit and doesn't need a CPU or computer to be attached. So right now, a lot of the virtual reality experiences, a lot of the designs, you have like some type of like notebook type thing or some type of server that needs to be connected to it. That's no good. It's gotta be something smaller. It's gotta be, I don't know, the weight of maybe a pair of glasses, a bit heavier. We'll get there eventually. But to, but to be able to really grow and scale, that's kind of what's gonna need to happen so that everybody can afford it and that the experiences can be ubiquitous. Speaking of experiences, experience escape velocity. So right now, Let's say you went to Netflix and Netflix had two TV shows. Well, eventually when you run out of shows, you don't want to watch anymore. Now, suddenly when Netflix gets to the situation where they're launching more and more and more shows faster than you can watch them, well, shit, now I just have to say subscribed. Same thing will happen with VR. As we have more and more experiences and reach an experience escape velocity where you can't physically do them all, we can't physically visit all the worlds, you can't physically play through all the quests, etc. That's when we'll start to see a major adoption of virtual reality. Jobs being created in VR that we can never envision. We talked about it a little bit, a little bit before. Some other interesting ones, maybe like a VR bodyguard. You don't want someone to shoot you in VR, so you have some dude who has to stand in as a bullet shield. Yeah, it's morbid, but you know what? He's not actually going to die, so it's okay. But it, maybe you don't want to lose your points, etc. And then the last prediction, which we talked about already, VR goggles will merge with AR goggles and become mixed reality. Ultimately, we'll probably have contact lenses we can turn on and off. That's kind of where we're headed. That's where we're going when it comes to virtual reality. Hopefully this has been fun and interesting. Hopefully you've gained something from this or found a bit of value. If you have, hit the subscribe button, share this with others on Facebook, Twitter, whatever you want to do. Leave a comment if it was interesting or if you have any opinions. And yeah, be sure to check out the overall podcast, Fringe.fm, where we get the world's smartest, most interesting folks tackling the biggest and most important problems for humanity. Fringe.fm. I'm your host, Matt Ward, signing off. Cheers.